Good afternoon. Um, I, I would like to spend a few minutes with you guys today and talk to you a little bit about the challenges that come into IT organizations with this just massive explosion of devices that we have seen coming onto the planet over the last 20 or 30 years and give you a little bit of perspective from a cybersecurity side about kind of how organizations should best defend against these things. To understand kind of the challenges that come with the device growth that we've seen in 2019, it's important to just step back the almost 30 years at this point when the internet started and kind of look at the trends that we've gone through here. You know, back in 1991, which is about a year and a half, two years after the internet started, is when we hit the 100 million devices online. Just to put it in perspective with you, we're seeing about three billion a quarter now coming onto the planet. So when you think back in the first couple of years of the internet, it was about 100 million devices. And really, there was a huge transformation happening in inside IT organizations at this point where we were all moving from very expensive mainframe-based applications to this new era of client server, where the same laptops that you gave your employees to do email and other tasks could also be used for some of the more mission-critical systems that you saw inside your business. The benefit of this from a financial perspective is it opened up the you know, smaller financial organizations now had access to some of the same technology that really had only been reserved for the largest organizations up until that point. As we move forward, it took us all the way until 2007 until we hit 1 billion devices online. So it took us about 16 years as a world to get to 1 billion total connected devices. The business value at this point was unbelievable. We were starting to see app platforms emerge like iOS and Android. The phones flipped from those little flip phones and Blackberries over to the phones that we use today where you could give mobile banking to your customers. There was all types of use cases that were being brought into the organization. The risk, unfortunately, that went along with this was this was the last time that your IT department actually had control of what it was that was on their network. And I remember this clear as day. I ran McAfee at this point, and I remember this debate with our CIO, and this new thing called the iPhone had come out, and lots of people wanted to use it for a couple of applications, and we didn't want to let it on the network because it wasn't a device that we'd purchased and loaded with product and put out to our users. But yet, there was a lot of momentum building up to be able to allow those things. We spent about three or four months to figure out a workaround, and right about then is when the Android came out. And, and since then, it has just been one additional operating system after another. But when you think back to 2007, CIOs at that point still fundamentally had control over what it was that was on the network. If it wasn't understood, it wasn't allowed in. Because at that point, we were you know, buying a physical server from HP or one of the companies that was out there and putting those in our data centers. We were giving Windows machines to our employees, and then we were allowing Blackberries. It was pretty much it. The iPhone, the Android were kind of the, the only BYOD use cases. And if you take that same phenomenon and you accelerate to where we are today, it depends on whose number that you believe, but it's about 15 billion devices that are on the planet in 2019. And the difference in this, the amazing difference inside of this now is that there are potentially hundreds of different platforms, but thousands of different machines, all with different operating systems. When you think about this, when the antivirus industry started, the, the benefit that the antivirus market had was everybody's laptop ran Windows. Now, you, now, now we allow TVs on our networks, like the ones in this room, and every TV manufacturer has their own operating system, and we allow printers, and they all have their own operating systems, and HVAC controllers and security cameras, and all of these same use cases that you would have in your house. When was the last time you bought something in your own house and put it up on the wall, a TV, and hardwired it to your network? It would never happen. You, plug, you expect to plug something in, hit the word network, pair, and have it work seamlessly. Just recognize that those same use cases, those same devices that are inside your environments are on that same network as every other device that you've got. Gartner says that by in, the, in the next couple of years that the average CIO will be responsible for three times more endpoints than they managed in 2018. So it's just one of the major tech evolutions that we all have to deal with as organizations is we, we have to embrace this. Those same CIOs now need to allow every device to connect to the network and figure out how to make sense of those devices on the back end and keep the, the, you know, the secure stuff secure and safe away from other devices. Concurrent with this, the other trend that we're seeing is this massive interconnectivity of different applications. The financial services industry is at the absolute forefront of this. As, 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 a, as my introduction said, I started off running a company called McAfee. I've been in a company called Forescout for about the last four years, and we're in the space 
of visibility. We're in this connectivity link, so we see this. Our biggest customers are the biggest banks, the biggest governments in the, you know, in the, in the world. What is amazing is, uh, that, that is happening in front of us is this interconnectivity of IT. Something like WannaCry hits, which hits hard into a place that is our industrial control systems, what we call OT, or the operational technology side hits, and all of a sudden we start seeing the same CIOs and CISOs, Chief Information Security Officer, being given responsibility for OT security or the industrial side of their business the same way that they've managed the IT side of their business. And those same CIOs now have their hands full. They're still dealing with the campus environments where the devices that are coming online into those environments are exploding like crazy. All of those use cases, TVs, security cameras, that volume is, is unbelievable. At the same time that they're having to take on the challenges of OT security. Companies like Maersk and FedEx had to publicly announce on their earnings calls the, the, the business disruption that came from that breach WannaCry, which is what made it so high profile. But we have to recognize that those systems are on the exact same network as a lot of the IT systems and that interconnectivity, although it's there for valid business reasons, right? You think about in, the, you know, in this industry, you've got the ATM networks, traders, you've got all different types of use cases that are all connected. You know, I, I, li I live here in California, and it's a little bit different example, but PG&E is our power company. And up until about four or five years ago, the OT side of their network, which would have been my house, was different. It was, it was, it was air-gapped, as you would call it, off from the IT side of, it, of, 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 of the house. But for ROI purposes, they didn't want to have the truck pull up in front of my house every three months and knock on the door and have to take your power reading. So they came out and they put these things called smart meters on the side of the house. I'm sure the ROI short term was amazing for them, but guess what? Now somebody can break into the IT side of the house, get over into your house and potentially take your house offline like we're seeing down south below the border these days. Massive blackouts because all of those systems are on the exact same networks and they, they, they become a threat attack vector for us. But this interconnectivity is, is unavoidable. There is nothing that we are going to do to stop this. There is too much business value in this interconnectivity. You think about it, you have pay payment platforms like Apple Pay and PayPal that want to be introduced into the same environments as credit cards and all the rest of this. And as a consumer, people expect to be able to do these things in a very real-time environment. The third dynamic that we see that is going on at the same time is that there is very little automation out there. 30 years ago, I think someone got in their mind that, oh my God, what happens if we take our CEO's laptop offline? We can't, you know, don't, don't block something or don't take action from the cybersecurity products. Let's look at it first and see what's going on before we start to take action. I can tell you this, as a CEO in my company, if, I, if my laptop had something terrible on it and I was about to propagate that within my organization, I would rather have my IT department block my machine than just simply let me on because of the position that I hold inside the organization. And I'm sure many of you feel the exact same way. But the reality is what we've done is we, we have stretched our operation teams because of this. If you look at this, we are going out to our, our, our operations teams, our IT operations teams in what's called the SOC, the Security Operations Center, which sounds fancy and in many of your organizations, they probably look a lot like the show 24 and there's screens and a lot of activity. The reality is those are necessary because of the number of cybersecurity products that you have in your environments that all have their own dashboard that is sharing a different unique view of what's going on inside your organization. So the SOC or the Security Operations Center exists to be able to take all that in and make a prioritization and begin to act on things. And there's a need for automation to happen in this industry. So when you look at this from a problem perspective, I think it's easy to understand that what do we do as an organization to potentially be able to help against this? There are three steps that I believe from a, from a cyber hygiene perspective are necessary for us to be able to beat the bad guys. The first is, and it sounds so very basic, but understand what's on the network. If, if it, it doesn't make a difference how well your IT department is doing on knowing a vulnerability, when something like WannaCry hits and your IT departments hear that it's exploited this older version of the Microsoft Windows operating system called XP, and the reason that's problematic is because it's not a version that is patched anymore because it's been retired, when, when, when all of a sudden WannaCry hits and we understand that it's exploited that, the first thing organizations have to try to understand is, do I have any of those in my environment? It's, it's a known vulnerability, but simply being able to understand with clarity what it is that's on the network is an important aspect of this. And if you think about the breach, take a look at Equifax as an example. A very highly publicized breach it was really interesting. 
from a PR perspective is they were one of the most forthright, they were one of the most forthcoming with all of the analytics that they learned about that breach. They wanted to share with the rest of the world what it was that they learned in their environment. The reality was they lost 143 million customers' records because a server was on that network that they didn't know was there. They owned a vulnerability management product, but the way it works is it takes a scan of the network periodically. And this malware understood how frequently they ran that scan. So it went dormant, it went off the network during the scan time. The same way that when you see one of those movies where there's a camera and the robber's coming into the building, all of a sudden they wait the 60 seconds between the cameras to be able to get through it, exact same concept. That was a known vulnerability, had not even a new vulnerability, but it, the reality was is simply understanding with clarity what it is that's on that network is a really important step into this. This is a big thing these days. You know, again, those to empathize with IT departments, the same IT organization that traditionally ran your data centers and your campus environments is now trying to figure out post WannaCry what to do in the OT world. Remember these OT machines, a lot of these, you know, whether it's in a generic application like building management, imagine how problematic it would be if all of a sudden in the middle of New York in the summer, all of a sudden the, 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 the heating system was taken off or in the middle of the winter, the heating system was taken off, the cooling and heating. I mean, there are, there are systems that are very mission critical to businesses that would be in this OT world for everybody. But when you start thinking about this, a lot of these large industrial manufacturing type environments, ATMs in the financial world, they have long lives. It's not a system that was designed like a cloud-based app to be able to be updated frequently. Right, you know, you get your iPhone, and all of a sudden a new version comes out two or three times in that first few months, you get updates. That's because they're patching little problems that they found in the operating system. That's much, much more difficult in either a cloud world or into an OT world because the machines online were never built to be able to be updated quite that frequently. Now we're take, taking those same IT departments and we're saying, you know what, move as aggressively as you can to the cloud. AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, they have a higher ROI. Those same IoT organizations now need to deal with an environment where part of the machines are on-prem and part are up in the cloud. So simply understanding with, with a very high degree of fidelity what it is that's on the network is a big, big part of this. The second step is to be willing to segment. Probably the best and worst breach to be able to describe this is Target. Target has, I will tell you, one of the most advanced cybersecurity organizations of any company I have ever dealt with on the planet. This is not at all because they were remiss in anything that they did. But the reality, like many large organizations, they have one large flat network. Nobody wants to have a large flat network. What that means is when you take your campus environment and your OT in the cloud and you try for business reasons to start having things that connect to each other, what you are left with is a network where all of the different things in your environment are connected. Bad actors understand that. They know they can get in through one open window and sneak into your house instead of trying to break in through your front door. And the reason I mentioned the target breach is, if you don't know the specifics on that one, what the, the way the malware was launched into target was through a subcontractor who didn't work for target, lived in Minneapolis, that was a, an HVAC control person. They, like a lot of folks, came in with a van, parked in the front, badged in the front door because they're a contractor and have a badge. They got on the network and should have only been able to access a very simple server in that environment called the HVAC server. That's all that they needed access to. But like a lot of organizations, that's not how their network works. This was Chinese at this point, but the, the, the malware that launched with the second that person turned their laptop on and hit the network, somebody had gotten onto that person's machine ahead of time and the malware was able to move all the way from what should have been the least privileged thing in that environment all the way over to the point of sale systems. They would have told you before that those systems were air-gapped off from each other. They were not air-gapped off from each other. But the reality is, is that you can, we can tackle this through segmentation. The switch vendors, there's all the firewall vendors, there are all types of technology out there that can help you. You know, put, put your work laptops in one part of the network. You've done this for decades. You know, Guest is different than the traders, but the rest in financial services and most of the companies that I meet with, the rest of it's all one giant network, one big bowl of soup. And you know, breach after breach shows that a, that, a, that, a, that a skilled attacker, if they get into that big network, is pretty capable of moving laterally, what's called east-west, moving, moving inside the organization to be able to achieve things. This can be accomplished through network segmentation. 
And then the third step is to be willing to automate. We have 15 billion devices online. That's over two, time, two per human being on the planet. Staggeringly, in another few years, we're gonna have double this again. The concept that your IT department is gonna be in the middle of every decision, a human being is gonna be in the middle of every decision is not practical. This is always the advice that I give to our customers is, go to your CEO's laptop last. Let's start with the easy use cases. If your TV tries to break into your SAP backend, are you okay taking that device offline? Let the cyber products that you have purchased do the job that you, that, that, that you acquired for them and let them actually take action. You know, if you, if you read this about a year and a half ago, it was a very major attack on the Northeast called the Dynatac. It was called the Mirai botnet, but it was the Dynatac. Uh, that resurfaced about a week ago. And that's how it happens, by the way, is, you know, the, the, the dark web, you don't even have to be able to be a hacker anymore to be a hacker. You can go buy online services on the dark web the same way that we can buy good things from companies that we do business with. But, but it reemerged, and it doesn't just attack, it attacks security cameras. That's, by the way, it's the most technically unsophisticated thing on the planet. This malware went around the world onto your security cameras trying to log on to them with the password and user ID that shipped from the security camera manufacturer, and it worked 100 million times. Now, now it's been built to be able to go after TVs and security cameras. And the reason I share this with you is that think about this in your own organizations. Many of you run these large, complex, global organizations. What would happen if all of the security cameras inside your own environment that were inside the firewall already but on your network turned around and pointed their, their effort towards one of your production servers? It could be very problematic. Be willing to allow things to be blocked. If an IoT device is, if, if there's something like a security camera or some simple use case that isn't assigned to an individual human being, allow cybersecurity products to be able to take those offline if they become problematic. Notify your security operations center of things that you blocked, not of problems that you have not blocked yet. Be willing to live with a little bit of help desk traffic from people that might legitimate users that might be calling in because they got tripped up in this to be able to keep bad things out of your environment. Now, we, we happen to be in, a, in an age right now where the amount of innovation coming onto the planet is unprecedented. I, as a consumer, it's unbelievable. I, you know, we, we're in a situation now where you know, Amazon has stores where you can walk in and just pick things up and walk out the front door and they can bill you correctly. In the financial services world, we're very close to a world where a consumer can walk in the front door of a bank and without anything having to be done, just by having their smartphone in their pocket, the bank can understand who that person is and potentially be able to tailor services and things like that. You know, the, 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 the speaker before me mentioned Uber and some of these organizations. You have high-tech companies now that are not just going after other high-tech companies. They're trying to automate parts of our life that are inefficient. Right? Airbnb, Uber have changed the game on the way that you book taxis and hotels and all that type of things. But the reality is, is that we're in any one. The amount of online innovation that's gonna come online in this next 10, next 10 years is gonna make that same curve I showed you earlier look you know, equal as it moves up and to the right. And we need to be able to get in front of this. So as one of the guys on the, uh, on the good side here, uh, I promise you that we are with you. Uh, you guys are an incredible audience and an incredible industry to, uh, to do business with. Thanks for your time, I appreciate it.